I mentioned um, somebody who I agreed with uh, back there a minute ago. Um, the person I want to quote from is uh, a scholar called Tom Boomershine, uh, who's held various posts at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, and most recently was a professor of Christianity and Communication. He also happens to be a Methodist, so I guess that uh, commends him to you all as well. Now, he wrote an article entitled Biblical Storytelling and Biblical Scholarship, and this is what he writes. It's hard hitting stuff. Historical criticism of biblical narrative, he writes, has been based on a false methodological assumption. That assumption is that we can accurately perceive the meaning and character of ancient Bible stories by studying them alone and in silence. The discipline, he says, has been based on systemic media anachronism in which we've uncritically read back into the ancient world the systems of meaning, production, distribution, and perception that have been characteristic of the media systems of document culture in the 18th to the 20th centuries. This false presupposition, he says, has systematically distorted our perception and understanding of the meaning and character of biblical narratives. Now, you don't have to look far in the way that the Gospels have been studied to see how that works out in practice. It led for a start to the various critiques of Mark that I mentioned right at the start, ranging from his allegedly poor Greek to the apparently annoying repetition of the word immediately, to the claim that he doesn't really have much of a storyline and on and on until we finally reach what looks like a most unsatisfactory conclusion to the whole thing. I already mentioned the statement by Papias that Mark was Peter's interpreter, and it's worth reminding ourselves what exactly he said, because he said that he wrote, quote, he wrote down accurately, but not in order, as much as he could remember of the things said and done by Christ, end of quote. Now, I think we've tended to latch on to the claim about Peter here, but what if the most significant thing that he says is that Mark's account was accurate, but, quote, not in order? What if that phrase that's conventionally translated as not in order has nothing to do with the sequence of the stories, the order they come in, but is a way of saying that this narrative doesn't follow any literary convention that Papias was aware of, that it's, if you like, disorganized when judged by the norms of classical rhetoric? What if Mark's gospel is perfectly well-ordered when we judge it by the conventions of oral performance, which presumably Papias didn't recognize? Is this what Tom Boomershine means when he talks about media anachronism in Bible study? That if we judge a text by reference to the conventions of our own literary culture, we'll not only distort what we think is going on, but we might actually miss the main point of it all. Now that leads us into a whole scholarly industry, far ranging, well beyond the um, boundaries of theology or church life. There's a whole scholarly enterprise exploring the nature of oral traditions and the way they operate in different cultures around the world. From traditional Norse fairy tales to the dreamtime stories of the original Australians and every point in between that you can imagine. Now, this isn't the place to explore any of that in great detail, but there are certain traits that are recognized as important in oral performative storytelling. And as soon as we look at Mark through this prism, it soon becomes obvious that the very things that documentary approaches regard as deficiencies in style and presentation are actually the very characteristics that identify Mark as a gifted oral storyteller. So think of some of these um, things that we find in Mark that share the characteristics then of what we might call oral literature. I noted earlier, and everybody knows that it's the shortest of all the gospels. But when we lay it against the uh, oral literature of other cultures, it turns out to be pretty much the right sort of length for oral literature. It's the kind of length that anyone can learn it from just hearing it being performed. Then it also uses performance techniques 
so that each episode is described in short, simple sentences with a subject, a verb, and an object. And there's really a notable absence of lots of conjunctions, subclauses, and other complicated forms of expression. We also notice that the story grows organically. It develops in short snippets so that teaching doesn't appear as a continuous discourse organized into topics or themes. That's what Matthew did. Instead, it's all embedded in short stories, which is exactly the way that oral cultures operate. And then there's the question of the plot or non-plot when you judge it by the conventions of literary processes. But Mark's narrative works in exactly the way that oral performance works. So that instead of a linear plot with a clear cut beginning, middle and end, the structure of Mark is, well, you'd call it cyclical, I guess, with repetitions and parallel episodes and revisiting the same kind of themes. Now, all of these things are the techniques that help performers as well as audiences, not only to remember the stories, but also to have memorable ways that they can use to repeat them to others. When you think about it, that's how soaps are made today. So if you watch EastEnders or um, Coronation Street or any of these others on a regular basis, you will recognize every single technique that I've just mentioned there. Um, so let's take a look at some specific features of Mark to see how this works. Well, story has many advantages over abstract ideas, and we've already talked informally about some of those. And the most obvious of it of them is the way that a story invites us into it. In an oral culture, people are generally aware of there being a story that's bigger and more expansive than just our own little lives, that somehow or another our lives are part, an integral part of a much bigger story. We are, if you like, the most recent installment or episode of it. Right now, we're in the process of trying to reinvent or recreate the UK story um, into a new story, which hopefully our politicians hope that we will now buy into and see our little stories as part of this bigger story. Whether they're successful or not is another's question. But I suspect that's a major reason why Christians today who are far removed from the realities of the Bible's world still find themselves drawn to it. I mean, it's a good question. Why do we still read the Bible at all? Given that it's 2,000 years out of date, but we do so because it offers us kind of archetypal stories, if I can put it like that. We find ourselves in a world that's some, um, in some sort of consciousness that in some way, this is the foundation account of our own stories. And I want to suggest that that's exactly where Mark both begins and perhaps more controversially, I want to suggest that's where he ends as well. So we have the opening words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, you and I read that on a page that immediately above that says at the top, this is the gospel according to Mark. So it's easy and possibly natural to assume that that first sentence, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is just means something like, well, you know, this is page one or this is where I'm going to start my story. And we might think in a purist kind of way, well, why would you say that? Isn't it obvious that this is the beginning? It's the first sentence after all. And we know from the statement at the top of the page that this is the gospel according to Mark. Um, I suspect that Matthew and Luke probably thought exactly like that. And they started their accounts of Jesus' life and teaching in a more conventional literary fashion. They went back even before his birth. In the one case, hundreds of years back to his forebears. In the other case, back to his conception. Now, we need to remember that none of the Gospels were written with the titles they now have. So the original Gospels, as written, didn't say at the top of the page, this is the Gospel according to Mark. So the first sentence was actually, in a sense, the title page of the Gospel. And that's really important. It's an importance that's multiplied many times over in oral communication. Those of you who are preachers, which might be the majority of you for all I know, you know and I know that the very first sentence you speak is key to what happens next. 
You either keep people alive and alert for the next two minutes, if you're really lucky, or they're turned off completely straight away. The first sentence is absolutely essential. And um, so Mark says, this is the beginning of the euangelion, the Greek word, which actually means good news. In context, the euangelion was news that would only be shared by a civic messenger making some special announcement about the achievements of the emperor, usually about battles or something else that the emperor, they were statements that would praise the emperor anyway. So right at the beginning, the choice of this word is more than just saying this is where the story starts. It's clear, first of all, that this is a story that might challenge the emperor's position by using that word euangelion, and by saying this is just the beginning of the euangelion, it invites the hearer to enter into the continuation of it, to reflect on the ongoing good news. Indeed, to say that, see that as part of their own life and experience. So this is the beginning. This is the first installment. And you, the people who are hearing this now, you are the continuation of this story. It's not an abstract story that's independent of you and separate from you. And then, of course, it dives straight into the opening story. As an adult, Jesus captivates the imagination of these fishing community people with his description of the kingdom of God. And the story then just continues immediately, 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 offering one glimpse after another of what this new way of being might look like until it reaches its dramatic conclusion with two women running out of a graveyard speechless and afraid. Now, jump with me from the beginning to the very end. That thing with the two women running out not knowing what to say and what to do next almost, from a literary perspective, this is a very inadequate conclusion, which is why efforts were soon made to tidy it all up by adding the so-called alternative endings to make sure that later readers would get the right message, that they would know the resurrection really did happen. But as performance storytelling, I mean, can you imagine a better way to end? It's the sort of ending that's actually designed to continue a story, to create a conversation rather than closing it down. Because anybody hearing that would think, what happened next? Where did they go? How did it work out? It raises questions rather than giving answers. And you can just imagine the first audiences who, as I say, I think were probably in rural Galilee, being energized to continue the conversation. They identify with the women because wouldn't you be scared if you just had that experience that they had, that somebody you thought was dead wasn't there any longer, and then you see these characters that you're not sure whether they're angels or what they are, but they definitely spook you out. I mean, can you not imagine people continuing that conversation, asking what was going on, and then sharing their own reminiscences of Jesus, their own questions as well, for that matter? that might then, if somebody shares something really interesting that you've not heard before, then the next time the story is told, what you've heard will be incorporated into the ongoing story because actually that's how oral performance works. So you can imagine new versions of the story emerging all the time. <coughs> it's different people share their own reminiscences and then the storytellers combine them more or less randomly till you end up with a longer narrative. This is how oral culture works. One performance builds on another. Stories are adapted to different audiences. Different performers have their own twists and refinements. So if Mark was so successful a communication of the stories of Jesus, why did interest in Mark decline so quickly? Because it certainly did. Second century Christian writers have more than about 1,400 references and quotations from the Gospel of Mark. But if you look at the Christian writers who were making a splash 100 years later, you can only find something like 250 references to Mark. And then finally, a few centuries later, Augustine dismisses Mark entirely as just being an inferior version of Matthew. Well, <clears throat> it's probably no coincidence that what I've just described parallels the rise of relatively elite men as church leaders. 
men who came from backgrounds that favoured the more literary constructions of Matthew and Luke and just didn't understand the world of performance storytelling. And I wonder also, could it also be because the storytelling style reflected in this gospel was in that cultural context to a considerable extent the domain of women? And was the marginalization of Mark part of a more extensive command and control exercise in those early centuries that led effectively and inexorably into what we now regard as Christendom? Now, if even half of that is the story of why Mark is important, I think Mark raises some significant questions for us. It raises this question. Is it possible to encounter scripture authentically without interaction with the story and with other people in the process of doing so? Another question is this, is the message in the big picture rather than in the details of words and tenses and abstract concepts? And here's one that people like me need to think about. Does that mean that the ways in which we have studied the scriptures for the last 200 years or more the so-called historical critical method, is that as flawed as fundamentalism and for exactly the same reasons that it imposes its own literal understanding on the nature of written texts over against oral traditions in ways that actually suffocate the message that we should be hearing? And has the high church tradition with its theatricality unintentionally tapped into something fundamental to faith because that invites you into an experience um, which ultimately of course comes to this final question is scripture therefore intrinsically an invitation to meet God with a holistic engagement of heart mind soul and strength and have we majored on scripture as an engagement of the mind coming up with theologies and theories and ideologies and concepts and ideas and all the rest of it, when actually it's when it touches our hearts and our souls and inspires us to strength. So there's a lot more that could be said about Mark as oral performance storytelling, but that would be my answer to why Mark, why we still need Mark because we live in that sort of culture today, which warms to exactly how I've described it, which actually displays my own presuppositions and understandings of my own culture as well. Because when we read scripture, we bring something to it, we expect to learn something from it. And that's the process in which God speaks to us and we discern what the calling of God on our lives is even at this point in 2021. So, oh my goodness, I'm looking at the clock now. I've uh, looked at a different bit of my screen. I'm sorry, Lorraine, we're a minute past nine o'clock there. Yeah. No, it's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. But yeah, time has gone. But uh, John, that was wonderful. And there's so much of that that you've just said that so resonates with me as um, someone who's spent the last two decades trying to offer scripture in a, an accessible way to, to younger people who don't, who aren't necessarily word people or people who are engaging, you know, the, the complexities of, of their, their mind. Um, so it's really encouraging for me to hear you say what you're saying and think about how we, you know, we can use Mark's gospel um, with all people uh, and for it to be have have that depth of meaning, um, yeah, I'm so looking forward to next week. And um, I, I next think next time you mean? Oh, so, sorry, next next <laughs> time you two weeks two weeks tonight. Yeah. I think if we were sitting around a dinner table right now, I'd want to want to pause to serve up some cake and coffee, and um, and and see where we were in the wee small hours. I think we'd still be talking. So thank you, John, yeah. for your contributions um, tonight. We really look forward to what's going to come next. And um, I, I wonder if folk might be interested in those questions that you had at the end. If you want to kind of 
pop them in an email to me. I will circulate them to, to folks in case they want to reflect on them a bit more between now and when we meet again. And just remind us what the, the second session topic is on. Um, discipleship. So what does it mean to be a disciple, I think, is, is the question, which um, we'll start with the stories in the very first chapter of uh, Mark's Gospel and then unpack the journey of the disciples and reflect on what that's telling us in terms of discipleship today or what we might be called to do and what it would mean to empower other people to follow Jesus authentically as well. So that's that's what's in my mind. Actually, I think if you if you want to grab the uh, save these chat comments, there are, there are two or three there that I think we could come back to quite usefully absolutely. in the week. So if we if we save them, that would be really helpful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'll save them and put and, and just pop them to you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, not a problem to, uh, at all. Yes. So the next session is a fortnight tonight on May the eighteenth. Same time, half past seven. Uh, so do register on Eventbrite to get the link to join with us. And uh, we will be capturing this and sharing it on the YouTube uh, channel as well. So if you want to re-watch again on Catch Up or share with anybody else that's not been able to be with us tonight, then you'll be able to do that. So thanks again, John. Thanks to all my lovely colleagues and to all good folks for joining us and we will see you hopefully in two weeks time.